The next thing we want to look at, or the next example of the impact of worldview, is to look at it in relationship to time and history. We could simply ask the question, where is history going? We assume that every culture in the world sees time the same way we do, and that is not the case. Coming from a Judeo-Christian background, we see time as past, present, and future. But this is not the case when we look at secularism and at animism. In a secular framework, there is no creator and there is no heaven and hell. There's no afterlife. Is all we have is this life. And what we have in this life is this moment. We use the hourglass as a symbol for the modern man's concept of time and history. Time is running out. And as every day you live, you are closer to the sand running out in the hourglass. I remember when I was a freshman in college, I was taking a sociology class and the professor on the first day of class came striding out on the stage and he came to the microphone, looked across. At this time, there were about 250 freshmen in, in his class, and he looked out across the class and he said, what is the purpose of the life of a child that dies in infancy? And there was this long pregnant pause because he wanted each of these young students to think about that question. And after a couple of minutes, he returned to the microphone and all his pride and arrogance, he said, the purpose of the life of a child that dies in infancy is to be fertilizer for a tree. And we were all stunned. But you know what? He's right. If there is no God, if we're here by a cosmic accident, our life has no purpose, and the life of the child who dies in infancy has no purpose. But the thing this professor did not have the courage to answer was what was the purpose of his life. Because if there's no purpose in the life of the child, there's no purpose in the life of that professor. So a secularist view sees time as running out. The animistic worldview sees life on a wheel. We see this most visibly in Hinduism, with their concept of reincarnation. But we see this particularly in all animistic cultures where life just goes around and around and around. There's birth, life, death, birth, life, death. Or there's the agricultural cycles. You have spring where you have planting, and then the plants grow, in the fall you have the harvesting, and in the winter the land lies fallow. But life just goes around on the wheel. And when people think this way, they think fatalistically. In Spanish-speaking cultures, they'll say, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. In Islamic cultures, they'll say, inshallah, Allah wills. Life is fatalistic. Can't tell you how many places I've been in the world where you hear people say, you know, we're poor, 
We're born poor and there's nothing we can do about it. And there's whole nations in the world today that think that way. We're poor, our grandparents were poor, our parents were poor, we're poor, our children will be poor, and there's nothing we can do. These two worldviews will not allow for nations to flourish. The secular worldview, if you look at the West today, we live in the present. We've forgotten the past, there is no future. We live to go to the mall. We live to consume. The old hedonistic mantra is ours today, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. And just look at the Western world and increasingly in developing countries. The sign of progress is the sign of the mall and you, you work so you can go and spend because there is no future and history has no meaning. And in animistic cultures, they tend to live in the past. They're always looking to the golden age of the past. But the Bible says something very different. The Bible says there was a beginning, there's a flow of history, and there will be an end. There's a past, present, and future. Animists, in their fatalistic mindset, say that history is something that happens to us. But the Bible says something very different. The Bible says, no, history is something that you create. You make history with your words, with your choices, with your thoughts. Let's look at a couple of passages of Scripture. First of all, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1. Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive the city. What is it that God is looking for? He is looking for one person. Not 10,000 people. He's not looking for 1,000 people or 100 people or even 10 people. He's looking for one person. But a particular kind of person. One who seeks justice and deals honestly. And if he finds that one person, he will redeem the city. An individual's life can be used by God to change the course of history. I remember my mentor Francis Schaeffer used to say that in Hinduism, if you throw a rock in a pond and the rock represents a person, if you throw a rock in the pond, it makes no ripples. Our lives count for nothing. But in the biblical picture, you throw a rock in the pond and it creates ripples that go on forever. We have the ability to make decisions that alter the course of history. We see something similar in the book of Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 14. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise. And he saved this city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. 
but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. I love this story. You have a small city, and it's surrounded by a mighty king, and he's set up siege works. And what does God use to save this city? One man. And did this one man have a lot of money? No, he was poor. Did he have a big army? No. What did he have? He had wisdom. And God used that poor man and his wisdom to defeat a mighty army. What was the man's name? We don't know. God knows his name, but history does not know it. And the reason I love this story so much is it shows that God can use poor individuals to change the course of history. I was sharing these things in Rwanda a number of years ago, and I had a young woman come up to me. Her name was Helen. And she said, Darrow, will you tell my story? And I said, Helen, if you tell me the story, I'll tell it. And I've been telling her, her story for 10, 12 years, maybe 14 years. Thousands and thousands of people around the world have heard Helen's story. When Helen was about 18 years old, she was living in Kigali, Rwanda. Very poor, so poor that they did not have electricity in their home. They had an oil lamp that they would use to uh, see in their house at night by this oil lamp. And one night, Helen uh, noticed the, the oil in the lamp was running low. So she started refilling the lamp with oil, and while she was doing this, the lamp exploded. And burning oil went all over her arms and her hands. And she was screaming. She was frightened. Her family came and put the fire out. Her brother rushed her to the hospital, and the doctor in the hospital took one look at her arms and he said, I'm so sorry, they're too burned, I'm going to have to cut them off. You can imagine being a young woman, hearing that your arms were going to be amputated. Her brother was with her fortunately and he said to the doctor, look, you need to try and save her arms, you need to treat them, and if you treat them and you can't save them, then you can cut them off. And the doctor said, no, they're so badly burned, I'm going to cut them off right now. And the brother said, if you cut them off without treating them, I will sue you. And so the doctor treated her arms. And today when she tells the story, there's a sparkle in her eye and her arms and hands dance as she tells her story. And she said, Tell the world, my brother changed the history of my life. Her brother changed the history of her life. History is not something that happens to you. History is something you make. One of my heroes, and the heroes of many, is a man named William Wilberforce. Wilberforce lived in Britain at the time of the slave trade. He uh, decided after graduating from university to run for a seat in the House of Commons. And at 21 years old, he became the youngest um, commoner, as it were, in the House of Commons. When he was about 24, he became a Christian. 
And when he became around 27, he wrote in his journal that God put a call upon his life. And the call was for him to lead the fight to end slavery and to bring about a civilizing of British society. Well, Wilberforce began to give speeches all over England. He began to unite with some other people who were involved in the abolitionist movement. And year after year, he would write a piece of legislation to end the slave trade, and each year it went down to a glorious defeat. Year after year, Wilberforce worked to end slavery. Forty-three years after he received the call of God upon his life, slavery despite all of his efforts, is still the law of the land. Three nights before he died, Wilberforce was in on his deathbed, and he got a note from London saying that Parliament had passed the legislation to set slaves free and end slavery in the British Empire. 43 years. What did God use? One man. It wasn't only one man, but one man who was the voice for the movement to bring an end to slavery. What has God made you for? He has made each of us to stand in a gap somewhere. And what is the gap that he has made you to stand in. It may be for an individual. It may be for a family. It may be for a community. Or it may be that God has made you to stand in a gap for your nation. What have you been made for?